searching for traces of a mysterious age. Could a sword with magical powers really have existed? Where was the fabled castle of Camelot? Who was King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table? Where was the legendary Grail Castle located? The castle which housed the most sacred relic of Christendom. The Holy Grail. Our journey begins in the mountains of southwestern Germany, where archaeologists have discovered the grave of a Celtic prince. The man was buried over two and a half thousand years ago. Along with his body, they found a burial offering, a valuable bronze vessel. The first step in our search for the Holy Grail takes us into the mysterious world of the Celts. The Celts came to Europe from the east, traveling west through the Danube Basin, the Alps, and into the mountains of Central Europe. With them, they brought their culture, rituals, and traditions. They introduced the horse to Europe, which had already been domesticated in Asia. And they brought iron, which proved more durable than bronze. In Celtic times, it was traditional to bury a prince together with his belongings. His belongings were a gift to the gods. They ensured that in the afterworld, where the invisible souls of the dead live on, he would lack nothing. As part of the ritual, priests cast jewelry into sacred lakes. As well as swords, the most important funerary offering. Among the hundreds of objects archaeologists have recovered from sacred lakes is the Celtic longsword. The Romans were terrified of its razor-sharp blades of iron. They used a short sword that was only suitable for hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Celtic longsword was a very effective thrusting weapon, which enabled the warrior to keep his opponent at a distance. At the Romano-Germanic Central Museum in Mainz, a long sword found in a Celtic grave is being examined. The blade of the sword is curved. It was intentionally bent out of shape during the funeral to render it useless. It is from the long Celtic sword that the myth of Excalibur originated, the undefeatable weapon with magical powers. Magical powers have also been attributed to vessels. At a time when people often faced hunger, the Horn of Plenty had a special significance. It was eternally filled with food. Bowls, jugs, chalices and cauldrons were all considered magical vessels. The earliest Grail story is a poem in which Arthur and his men go in quest of a magical, a magical vessel, a cauldron. Uh, which uh, cauldrons were regarded as magical very often in the old Celtic mythology. Then what happens uh, is that the story of the quest is taken up in the Middle Ages and the, the vessel is turned into a Christian object. But certainly there is a pagan background here. According to Celtic tradition, the legendary King Arthur set off on a mysterious voyage to find the magic cauldron. His perilous journey began on a lake that led to the underworld, the kingdom of the dead, believed to be at the center of the earth. Arthur was denied entry by a guard, but through cunning and valor, he managed to get past the ghosts and demons. And not only did he defeat the forces of the underworld, but he wrestled the magical vessel from them. With the vessel in his possession, according to legend, he became master of life and death. 
In one of the Grail stories, I believe, there is the notion of this magic cauldron, this cup of eternal life, this inexhaustible horn of plenty, just as there is the sword of light of the Celtic gods, which is then given to the heroes. The narrative and its protagonists, together with certain typical objects, all come from the Celtic realm. The Celts believed that nature was divine. Plants, animals, and even rocks communicated with human beings. Everything had a soul. The fairies, elves, and sorcerers found in modern fairy tales were believed to inhabit the natural world. They intervened in the fortunes of men. Priests were in contact with the beyond. The Celts gathered for regular worship in a magic grove. The priests and druids were the storytellers, poets and philosophers, and they possessed healing powers. Sorcerers blessed the righteous and cursed the evil. With their rites and incantations, they pacified the powers of nature. Deeply rooted in the Celtic belief system was the notion that warriors could be resurrected after death. The Celts were merciless warriors. Men and women alike entered into battle wild and unrestrained. For them, it was customary to behead their enemies, as a beheaded warrior could not be resurrected. This barbaric ritual may help shed some light on the story of the Grail. The Celtic relief on this vessel from the 1st century BC provides a clue to the story of the Grail. The prince on the left is plunging an unscathed warrior headfirst into a vessel. Below are warriors who have been brought back to life from the kingdom of the dead through the same process. Like the Christians after them, the Celts believed in resurrection. The discovery of the grave of a prince in Hochdorf near Stuttgart has astounded archaeologists. Inside the prince's grave, they found a bronze cauldron and an enormous drinking vessel, large enough to accommodate a human being. In all human cultures, drinking plays a special role. In many ritualistic practices, drinking serves a magical function. We know this to be particularly true of the Celts, who had magic vessels, vessels that could bestow salvation or special powers. This tradition is continued in the idea of the Holy Grail, the vessel that nourishes and brings salvation. After the fall of the Celts, the notion of magic vessels lived on, and the first stories of the Holy Grail were born. In the act of communion, Christians commemorate the Last Supper, when Jesus filled a chalice with wine to symbolize his blood. The chalice and the wine became symbols of eternal life. The events in the last days of the life of Jesus Christ are well known. The story of his crucifixion has been told, written and represented countless times. But there are lesser known sides to the story, and one of them involves the Holy Grail. According to legend, the Roman captain Longinus stabbed the crucified Jesus in the side with a lance. Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished merchant and a relative of Jesus, collected the blood of Jesus in the chalice used at the Last Supper. 
Many people believe that this chalice was the Holy Grail. All of this was claimed by the church, and this grail, that is the receptacle we call the grail, was made out to be the container of the blood of Jesus Christ, collected by Joseph of Arimathea upon his descent from the cross. Jesus was placed in the family tomb of Joseph of Arimathea himself. These legends and traditions form the basis of the myth of the Grail and the impassioned quest for the Grail pursued by King Arthur's knights. His knights were initially nothing but simple warriors, but they needed an ideal, the chivalric ideal of the Arthurian legends. It was a quest for perfection, symbolized by the Grail. According to tradition, Joseph of Arimathea kept the chalice, but as a follower of Jesus, he was pursued, arrested, and sent to prison. Upon his release, he abandoned his homeland, and following an ancient trade route across the Mediterranean, he travelled via Rome to the south of France. Joseph is believed to have settled in Languedoc, together with some of the other disciples, including Mary Magdalene. Could the Grail have made its way to Europe along this route? From an archaeological point of view, it's thoroughly conceivable that a distinguished man such as Joseph of Arimathea could have taken this vessel, which had been used on festive occasions such as Passover. Where the Holy Grail was kept once it arrived in Europe, nobody knows. There are many conflicting accounts. One of the oldest beliefs is that Joseph, and possibly even Jesus himself, visited Britain and took the Holy Grail with him. Joseph went ashore in the south of England and travelled to what is now Glastonbury, and it was here that he spent the rest of his days and founded the first Christian church on British soil. The site where the ruins of a Benedictine abbey stand is certainly one of the most sacred in the country, perhaps because it once saw the Grail itself. There are different versions of this Grail story. But in England, it was said that it was brought here uh, to, well, of course, the town of Glastonbury wasn't here then, but that it was brought here soon after the crucifixion, and then it was lost, and Arthur's knights went in quest of it. From this point on, the Holy Grail was closely associated with the legendary King Arthur and his knights. The Roman withdrawal from Britain in the 5th century was a disaster for the Romano-British left behind. Nothing could stop the barbarians flooding across Hadrian's Wall, once a secure border between the barbarian north and Roman Britain in the south. Without an organized defense force, the country soon fell into chaos. Only one British king was able to stem the forces of anarchy, Arthur. In a series of battles, Arthur defeated all the invaders. There followed a few glorious years of peace and stability. Arthur's achievements became the stuff of legend. He was the embodiment of Britain's golden age. And as the turmoil of the Dark Ages continued, people hoped for the return of a man like Arthur, or even Arthur himself. On a thin strip of land in North Cornwall stands Tintagel Castle. The walls of the ruins date from a later era, but the foundations go back to the time of Arthur. We cannot be sure of the dates, but it is believed the Celtic king was born here in around 470 AD. Beneath the castle is a grotto known as Merlin's Cave, named after the legendary sorcerer who served as tutor to the young Arthur. By now, many Celts had converted to Christianity, but pagan traditions still determined their way of thinking. The transition from the old to the new religion was a gradual process.
In the myth of the Holy Grail, pagan and Celtic elements mix with Christian ones. The story of the magic sword Excalibur is Celtic. According to legend, Excalibur could defeat any foe. He who pulled Excalibur out of a stone would become the ruler of Britain. The legend proved true in Arthur's case, and the sword led him from victory to victory. At the end of Arthur's life, one of his faithful followers cast Excalibur into a sacred lake, in keeping with the Celtic tradition. Camelot, the legendary castle of King Arthur, and the place from which the quest for the Grail began. Historians still argue over whether this castle ever really existed. We have to be careful about Camelot. People sometimes think, oh, that was the capital of England in Arthur's time, but it wasn't. In all the stories of Arthur, Camelot is his headquarters. There's nobody there before him, there's nobody there after him. Now, of course, Camelot, as you see it in films and so on, could never have existed. There would never have been a great, magnificent medieval castle in the Dark Ages, in the fifth century or whenever it was. But it's quite possible that Arthur did have a headquarters. And there's quite a good reason to think that this was a place called Cadbury, Cadbury Castle. Cadbury Castle, the south of England. This man-made enclosure with earthen walls is one of the largest hill forts in the country. According to archaeological evidence, a large and impressive settlement was built here in the 5th century, the time when Arthur reigned. Could that settlement have been the castle of Camelot? Dinas Bran in mountainous northwest Wales. The ruins of a more recent castle complex jut out over the landscape. According to several historians, this would have been the ideal location for Camelot. Or does this castle in central England conform more closely to our image of Camelot? The only thing that can be said with any certainty is that the authors of the later Arthurian sagas entertained a vision of Camelot that did not conform to the sober reality of the Arthurian age. Castles at the time were constructed of rough-hewn beams and surrounded by palisades. Living conditions would have been poor the tools primitive. If Camelot really existed, it was probably just a collection of rough wooden structures. According to legend, at the end of his life, Arthur traveled by boat with a fairy to the mythical island of Avalon. Like the magical sword Excalibur and the mysterious castle of Camelot, nobody knows if Avalon was fact or fiction. The exact location of Avalon has faded from human memory. There are a number of different places that fit the image of the legendary island. St. Michael's Mount off the south coast of Cornwall is a perfect match. So is this island. located off the coast of Brittany. And there are many other possibilities.
But historians believe the key to Avalon's location may lie in its name. The name Avalon it really means apples, an apple place. And this is apple growing country, but the Avalon of mythology seems to have been a sort of other world, fairyland, whatever you like to call it, with enchanted apples where the people were immortal. And according to one legend, it was the last place that Arthur went to after his final battle. And some said he was still living there, he was immortal. Uh, others said uh, that since he was buried at Glastonbury, this cluster of hills around here must be the real Avalon. In the 13th century, the monks of Glastonbury discovered a sign on this grave. It read, Here lies Arthur. Today it is generally assumed that this was a forgery. A ruse designed to attract a fee-paying public to the gravesite near Glastonbury. Others believe that Arthur and his knights are resting here in the Eldon Hills, prepared to rise again should England call them. More than 500 years after Arthur, in the 11th century, the English court, influenced by the French, developed an interest in the arts. Courtly authors began to write about a famous king called Arthur and his quest for the Holy Grail. There is no historical evidence for this next chapter in the Grail story. We are entering a purely mythical world, the world of the legendary Round Table. The Round Table was an assembly of honorable knights who dedicated their lives to the quest for the Holy Grail. To become a member of the elite group, the knights had to conform to the new ideal of chivalry and virtue. The Arthurian age is a golden age. It is an age of just and generous men, when things were shared, when virtue was rewarded. It is also a world in which one communicated with the supernatural, in which one could prolong one's life and elevate it to a higher plane. As Arthur's favorite, Lancelot is perhaps the best known of the knights. He was a man who strived for perfection, and dedicated his life to the holy cause. But even Lancelot wasn't perfect. According to legend, Lancelot fell madly in love with King Arthur's wife, Queen Guinevere. It was an ill-fated, adulterous romance from the start, and it thwarted the knight's quest for the grail. Lancelot's betrayal tore the world of Camelot apart, Passion and illicit love clouded the knightly community's sense of mission, which strived for virtue and purity. This moral decline threatened the demise of the chivalric world. In the court of Camelot, unfaithfulness was the worst crime. For Lancelot and Guinevere, the consequences of their actions were dire. Arthur condemned his wife to death. Lancelot became an outcast and was expelled from the community of knights. Lancelot grew remorseful and at the end of his life he entered this monastery in the north of England known as Lancelot's Priory. Arthur continued to follow his destiny Embracing the model of Jesus Christ and his apostles, the Knights of the Round Table formed a mystical community. As the first of the Knights, Arthur commanded his faithful followers to search for the Holy Grail. Everyone sits at the King's right hand, and each has his own freedom within the community. It is an attempt to create a classless society. It is perfectly idealistic, 
perfectly utopian. It is as if the authors of the Arthurian romances wanted to show that it was possible for a human brotherhood or society to function with individuals who are free to act whilst remaining in a collective. But what made Arthur decide to form the Knights of the Round Table in the first place? At the time the tales were written, Europe had been forced to accept a terrible defeat. The Holy Land had finally fallen to Muslim invaders. Humiliated, the Crusaders returned home with their hopes dashed, their dreams shattered and their faith shaken. They needed new meaning in their lives, and they found it in their quest for the Holy Grail. King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table never found the Holy Grail. If the Grail did come to Europe, where was it now? According to an account in Rome, the Holy Grail spent 300 years in Italy. The monk, St. Lawrence, was the keeper of the Grail. He guarded it against theft and destruction during turbulent times. Towards the end of the third century, it is believed that St. Lawrence took the Grail from Italy to his hometown in the Eastern Pyrenees in Spain. Under the steep slopes of the Pyrenees there are many caves. It is here that the relic is supposed to have been hidden. This would have been the perfect hiding place. The mountain is a natural deterrent. From this point on, the sequence of events in the tumultuous history of the Holy Grail can be followed more precisely. If from here we trace the journey of the Grail backwards and think it through once again, from the Middle East to Rome, from Rome to Huesca in the Pyrenees, from there, in face of the Saracen onslaught to here, this secluded place, then it is very probable that it found refuge in this area. During the High Middle Ages, a new piety emerged from both sides of the Pyrenees, which inspired people to make pilgrimages. Through high mountain passes, a path was mapped out, the route to Santiago de Compostela. This ancient pilgrimage route is still in use today. It attracts believers from all over Europe. Many churches are dotted along the way, and everyone tempts the traveler with relics from the past. Was the grail among the holy relics that were venerated here? At the beginning of the 12th century, crusaderdom was in decline. According to legend, soldiers returning from the Holy Land brought a mysterious ampulla back with them, containing drops of Christ's blood. Could this vessel have been the Grail? Around the year 1200, the doctrine of transubstantiation was accepted by the church, which is to say that the wine in the chalice is truly the blood of Christ, and the grail, the grail romances, that of Chrétien de Troyes, but those of the others as well, all his successors, spread the word about this new theology. 
Thus, the myth of the Grail, which was originally pagan, became a Christian symbol to promote the ritual of the Eucharist and of the Holy Sacrament. But not everyone agreed with Rome's new theology. Far from Rome, at the foot of the Pyrenees, stands the fortress of Montségur. It was here that the followers of a Christian sect sought refuge, the Cathars, or the Pure. The Cathars regarded Roman papacy as worldly superstition. They rejected the clergy of the Catholic Church, who had been corrupted by wealth, and instead they preached poverty and a return to a simple faith. According to legend, the Cathars were guarding a secret treasure, possibly the Holy Grail, and they were hiding it in Montségur Fortress. To crush the heretics, the Pope launched a crusade against the Cathars. In spring 1244, more than 200 Cathars were burned at the stake, but not before the Holy Grail was moved to a safer place. To this day, there is no evidence to suggest the treasure the Cathars were guarding was the Holy Grail. And how it was smuggled out of the besieged castle also remains a mystery. This small church is on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. It is said that for centuries, this niche held the Holy Grail. In the 12th century, many Grail romances were written. In 1210, the German Knight Templar Wolfram von Eschenbach wrote a beautiful poem describing the adventures of Parzival. Wolfram viewed the Grail as an object, a stone with magical powers. Like the mythical Horn of Plenty, this stone offered food and eternal youth. His knowledge is believed to have derived from a man called Kiot, which is a diminutive of Giam. We are hoping to find out the true identity of the person behind this mysterious name. The trail leads us to Toledo, in Spain. At the time, Toledo was a center for sciences and literature. The legacy of centuries is collected in the archive of the city's cathedral. Manuscripts and books written in Arabic, Hebrew and Latin. And there is evidence of the author of the original story of the Grail. In a document from the 12th century, we came across a scribe from the south of France he signed himself Guillaume of Narbonne, in Latin, Nabonensis Guilhelm. If he is the man who Wolfram referred to, then he must be the author of the original story of the Grail, the mysterious Kiot. The document was commissioned by Queen Oraka, the wife of King Alfonso I. Alfonso ruled over Aragon and Navarra in the mid-12th century, a time when the veneration of the Grail had reached its first peak. Following Kiot's descriptions, we travel to eastern Spain in search of further clues. This is the church of San Pedro el Viejo, in the small town of Huesca. King Alfonso I regularly came here for quiet contemplation. We know that here too, 
the Grail was long venerated. The name Alfonso, Anfortius in Latin, is related to Anfortus. Anfortus, in turn, is the name of the king in the Grail story. Was the king of Aragon and Navarra the historical model for the keeper of the Grail? Did the ruler have himself and his dynasty immortalized in the Grail poem? There is one more similarity. As the historical King Alfonso I retired to his castle at the end of his life to nurse a fatal wound, the Grail King Anfortus waited to be delivered from his endless torments. There was only one person who could bring them deliverance, the future keeper of the Grail, Parsifal. In the Grail romance, Parsifal journeyed for many years before he found the mysterious castle of Anfortus. The name Parsifal also leads us to Spain, where a Spanish count may have been the model for the knight, Parsifal. The count was the king's cousin. His nickname was Perche de Val, or Parsifal. And he was not just a legendary figure. His name is on this family tree. But what about the places mentioned in the Grail story? On this abandoned chapel, a cross, held like a weapon, has been carved into the wall. It is a symbol of the Knights Templar. The Templars, who guarded the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, became the keepers of the Grail. Here we find something remarkable, the remains of a hermitage, or those of later structures, which is mentioned in Parsifal in connection with the Grail Castle. The hermitage is here and the Grail Castle is here. The two are placed in relation to one another in such a way that it is very likely that this is the path that is repeatedly described in the poem. It is believed that the Grail Castle was located close to here, concealed in the wilderness, invisible to the naked eye. We begin our search within a 20-kilometer radius of this spot. In the Middle Ages, castles were a symbol of strength and rule, they were erected on sites that commanded respect, even from a great distance. The castle was the mightiest building visible to the naked eye from a great distance. Now, when we hear that a castle is impossible to find, invisible, indeed only accessible in a state of grace, it is such a paradox that one is initially stunned and baffled. One must take this into consideration in order to understand the impact this story had on people in the Middle Ages. A castle that was invisible was utterly unimaginable. But the whole thing would have been a very pale story indeed if the epic, this myth, did not contain some grain of truth. And here it is. We take a path that apparently leads nowhere and suddenly see this castle before us. In a remote valley in the Spanish Pyrenees is a perfectly hidden castle. This is the fortified abbey of San Juan de la Peña. It's the place where the mortally wounded king...
King Alfonso I was taken. The inner courtyard is impressive. We have here a double row of burial niches in the courtyard of the abbey and find a very interesting representation. An anchor had been worked into this Christian symbol. Parsifal had an anchor in his coat of arms, so we may assume that this anchor is a further link in the larger chain of evidence that we are trying to uncover. Barcelona, Spain. In the royal register in the town's library, there is further evidence of the grail. A document refers to the fortified abbey and a gift. The gift is an object described, half in Spanish and half in Latin, as a callus lapideum, or stone chalice. The same stone chalice was reputed to have been in the chapel at San Juan de la Peña. In the oldest part of the abbey, there are vaults hewn out of stone, ideal for housing the grail. We imagine that the grail was kept in this lower section, wholly within the rock, in a niche or on the altar. The chapel mentioned in the document from the royal register is located above the vaults. It is constructed like a temple. This is the room that Parzival was searching for, and which the Grail literature describes as a temple inside a castle. According to the story, when Parzival finally reached the Grail castle after his many adventures, he witnessed the Grail procession. It was led by the Grail Maiden. Behind her, a porter carried the lance used to pierce the side of Jesus Christ. The blade of the lance never ceased to bleed. A female bearer was also present. She carried the platter upon which the head of John the Baptist supposedly lay. On this occasion, Parzival didn't deliver the wounded King Alfonso I from his suffering. Only during his third visit to the castle did Parzival bring deliverance. This is the little door which Wolfram von Eschenbach mentions and through which the Grail Maiden, Reponge de Scheuer, carried the Grail in solemn procession to place it before the Grail King and Fortis. The Grail King and Fortis resided here, and the Templars protected the Grail. Thus we must suppose that the Grail Castle, San Juan de la Peña, is the historical starting point for the story of the Grail, as it still exists in our literary tradition. We are now almost at the end of our quest for the Holy Grail. The final part of our journey will take us to Valencia, in Spain. Valencia, Spain. The side chapel in this cathedral bears the name Capilla del Santo Calif, or Chapel of the Holy Grail. Although the Catholic Church never officially recognized the Holy Grail as a holy relic, it has been venerated here for almost 600 years. Above the altar, there is a shrine protected by bulletproof glass. Inside it is the vessel mentioned in the document in the library in Barcelona. Calis Lapideum, the stone chalice, the Holy Grail. Archaeologist Antonio Beltran has studied the chalice and can trace its path. Without a doubt, the Grail as we know it today was assembled in San Juan de la Peña, probably by goldsmiths from Byzantium. The upper chalice is of Near Eastern origin. It was probably made in Alexandria or Antioch. The archaeological findings are absolutely conclusive. This is a work of the period between the second half of the first century BC and the first half of the first century AD. 
On the lower part, that is the part made of stone, which forms the foot of the vessel, there is an Arabic inscription, and it certainly dates from a time before the vessel's arrival in San Juan de la Peña. This stone was used as a base. According to the Grail poem, at times a strange inscription appeared on the Grail, Al Lapsit Silis. The meaning of the barely legible Arabic characters has not yet been worked out. In his Parsifal romance, Wolfram calls the Grail Lapsit Exilis. It is unlikely that this is just mere coincidence. The stone which he describes as the Grail is the stone base of the Grail vessel in Valencia. We have reached the end of our journey, our quest for the Holy Grail. It has taken us from east to west, from the Celtic to the Christian era. But there is no real conclusion to our story. The Grail will forever remain elusive, as the lines are blurred between invention and reality, fantasy and history. The Holy Grail will always represent different things to different people. What is certain is that more than eight centuries after the first stories were written, the Grail and King Arthur continue to stimulate our imagination. The quest for the Holy Grail goes on.